Welcome to episode 69 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. This episode's main segment, I'm interviewing John Gerald again. This is going to be the second segment in a three-part series um, that I did with him. We get deeper into his career and talk about some of the more frustrating moments as a screenwriter, so stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they are greatly appreciated. A couple of quick notes, any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found in my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts, and then just look for episode number 69. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents and managers and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Also, a quick plug for the new SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high-quality professional script evaluation on your script. All the readers have experience reading the reading for studios, production companies, agencies, or contests. The readers I've partnered with are the gatekeepers. They're exactly the same people who are going to be reading your scripts at the companies you submit to. The readers will evaluate your script on several key factors like concept and premise, structure, character, dialogue, and marketability. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider or recommend and I'm also offering a bonus if you get one recommend from a reader you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts this is the same exact email and fax blast service that I use to promote my own script and it's the same service that I sell on the website it's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking to make movies also on the website, you can read a quick bio on each reader and pick the one who you would like to read your screenplay. One question I've been getting a lot about our Studio Reader 3-pack, right now it's on sale for just $1.99, so that's less than $67 per script read. I dare anyone to find better value anywhere out there. There really is no, um, there really is nowhere that I know of that you can get a seasoned reader to read a script for just sixty-seven dollars. So I think this is a great value, and it's just a great service. The notes, as I said, you'll be getting two to three pages of professional notes from these readers. People have been asking about how long the, um, the sale on the three pack is going to be going, and I don't really have a set answer. We just, um, it seems to be working. People seem to be responding to it. So I will keep the sale going for at least another month, maybe a little bit longer. We'll just kind of have to see. So if you want to check out the um, screenwriting analysis service, um, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. A quick few words about what I'm working on. I mentioned in the last podcast episode that I met with a, um, a producer director about my sci-fi thriller script. Well, I am going to option. In fact, I did option that script to him last week. Um, he has a couple of notes he wants me to address with the script. It seems like mostly it's a slight tweak to the ending. It's a pretty standard option deal. It's like a lot of the options that I've been signing recently. It's a free option for nine months. I'm going to be getting 3% of the budget, again, which is pretty normal, especially for a free option. Sometimes if the producer is paying for the option, we might negotiate a little bit less than the 3% of the production budget, like 2.5% or 2% of the budget. I think I have actually gotten those percentages on other scripts. Rush Lights was a script that I sold a few years ago. I think I only got 2% on that, and Dish Dogs was one of the first scripts I ever sold, and I think I got 2.5% on that. So that's sort of a typical range. Generally, when I give a free option, I try and get the uh, the, the top of the range, which, as I said, is, is the 3%, and I did get that for this, and I think that's perfectly fair because, as I said, I am taking a little bit of risk on the back end and should get sort of more towards the high end of the percentage. There's a minimum of $3,000, which means the budget would be about $100,000. And he wanted a ceiling of WJ minimum, so I can't make more than WJ minimum on this script sale. I honestly don't even know what that number is. In my experience, producers are usually lucky to raise the minimum budget, so I usually don't even worry too much about the ceilings, but some producers like to put a ceiling in there, 
which is fine because as I said, I, I've never had a producer come anything close to hitting that ceiling. You can renew the option. He can renew the option in nine months, but he has to pay me $500. This may not seem like a lot, but for an independent producer, it's going to make him really take stock in whether he can get the movie made or not. It sets a sort of deadline for him. So it's, it, it is something. So he knows he's got to wrap things up or else pay $500, which I found works nicely. One other important thing that I put into the contract was a clear statement that makes it clear that any rewrites I do are owned by me if he doesn't execute the option. This is important. He's not paying me for the rewrites or the option, so I should own them if he doesn't make the movie. Some of these ideas may be his ideas. Some of them may be a combination of his ideas and my ideas. You'll just never know. And that's why you can get really muddy if, if the producer tries to hang on to these rewrites to a script that you ultimately get back. It really is a kind of a muddied situation. There's a lot of ideas, as I said, that will just be floating around. Other producers in the future may come up with similar ideas. So it becomes very difficult to determine who owns what in terms of what ideas as far as the script. So it's important um, to me anyways that I get this into the contract. Contract, um, and make it absolutely clear that once, if he doesn't option the script, any ideas that he's contributed basically just become the prop, my, my property and the property in the script. Anyway, for the most part, um, he has pretty good notes, and that's a good sign. As I said, they're actually pretty minor, um, so I don't think it's going to take a lot of time to knock them out. Hopefully, I would say less than a week. Like all the options um, I've ever done, there is always this burst of excitement when we start, and then um, as things drag on, it usually goes downhill. So I'm optimistic right now. Hopefully, I'll remain like that. I want to be clear, too. I'm not a lawyer, so please, nothing I'm saying in these um, in this segment is should be construed as legal advice. I'm just telling you what I did. Um, I find it interesting to hear sort of how other people are navigating similar situations, so that's what I'm hoping to do. I'm just hoping to basically tell people what I'm doing and how I'm navigating those things. But, you know, every situation is different, so you need to decide for yourself if you need to talk to a lawyer. You need to decide for yourself, um, you know, what's right for you if a deal like this may not be be a good situation for you so that's something only you decide and um you know as far as the legal the legalities of a contract like this really you need um, to talk to a trained lawyer because because some some of these things can get kind of complicated so again just please don't take any of this as legal advice i'm just kind of telling you what i did i did finish um, a draft of my limited location mob action thriller screenplay so the timing on the rewrite um, for this sci-fi is pretty good I can kind of take a week off of my current project, work on this for a week, and then um, I should be um, hopefully have a little bit fresher eyes once I get back to my um, limited location mob action thriller. I'm actually putting up that script in my writer's group, the last um, third of it um, tomorrow. I'm recording this on a Monday, so I'm putting it up tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, so I'll get some notes, and then, as I said, I'll finish up this sci-fi thriller rewrite, and then I'll get back on to this mob action thriller screenplay. I'll have a nice set of notes from my writer's group, and then I'm hoping to basically get done. You know, we're in the middle of April, so I'm hoping to get done, you know, in May, let's say another month, maybe a month and a half. So maybe late May or early June, I will start blasting this script out using my email and fax blast service, sending it to my contacts. Anyways, so now let's get into the main segment. This is the second episode in a series with John Gerald. Um, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts and look for episode 67 to listen to the first episode I did with John. There's nothing really you need to hear before hearing today's interview. If you haven't heard the episode 67, it's not going to be a big deal. This will per make sense. But if, if you like today's episode, you want to hear more of John, definitely go back and look for episode number 67. As I mentioned, too, this is part two in a three-part installment, so keep an eye out. Um, in the next couple of weeks, I will be releasing that um, the the next installment of the um, of the final installment of the John Gerald interview. Also, one other quick note before we get into the main segment. John recently wrote a book called Tough Love Screenwriting. I do refer to it often in the interview. I'll link to it in the show notes. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a real good just insider account of screenwriting. There's a lot of just ins and outs. It's not necessarily a how-to book or anything like that, but it really just gives his, I mean, he's been doing this professionally for over 20 years now, and it just gives a good insight. There's a lot of just war stories and interesting in information. He did a bid section on WGA arbitration, um, very in-depth, so if you're, you're curious about WGA, WGA arbitration, it's you know really a great resource for that. So there are... <clears throat> 
there are a lot of topics in the interview that we cover um, from the book. You don't need to read the book to for the interview to make sense, but it will give you a little bit more context. So if you haven't read his book, definitely check it out. You can get it on Amazon. Um, as I said, I'll link to it in the show notes. You can get it on Amazon. You can get a Kindle version. You can get a um, you know a paper version. Anyway, here's the interview with John. Let's get into um, routine. You go into um, this a little bit in your book. Um, you mentioned needing to do have a routine to get going every day. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your routine as a you know working screenwriter. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously, I'm a little bit nutty. So, uh, as a tightly wrapped, type A, uh, curmudgeonly kind of guy, who admits he would take Pat Riley's coaching over anyone else, I'm really black and white about my ritual. So. It's usually, for years, I had an office down the street here in Mar Vista, and it, it's a process of, the bottom line is, I don't want to write every day. Now, I, I know some writers claim, oh, dude, I wake up and I dance a jig and I can't wait to sit there and write for six hours. That's not me. Writing's hard work for me. It's hard. Now, I assume it's work for everyone. I hope it's work for everyone. I don't think you have to be as... Uh, maybe dour as I am about it, but it's hard work, it's serious business. So for me, it's essential to have a ritual. So uh, back at, at that time with that particular office, I would literally, I know I'm gonna work today, so it was very straightforward, get up, make breakfast, on the drive between my place and the office, that's kind of like being in the locker room before the big game. So you're getting your mind set on, hey, I'm gonna write scenes 20, 21, 22 today, whatever your step sheet tells you, all right, here's today's goal, by the time I would get to the office, now I was psychologically set. The great thing about the office was, it was literally cinder block. There were, it was four cinder block walls, one window, which I immediately covered. There was no phone, didn't take a cell phone. There was, there was nothing in there with the slightest bit of pleasure involved. <laughs> um, it was a desk and a computer. And the great thing about that mindset was, there's only one reason to go to this office, and that's to work. If you start populating your office with toys and fun shit, you'll play with toys and fun shit. I, I don't think human being, we're the only animal that even does this where we would sit in front of a device and put down words. Animal, you know, watch Discovery Channel. The gorillas aren't doing it, the lions, I mean, we, it's, it's a little unnatural. And so it's, you gotta force yourself. Look where we live, man, it's Southern California. I'd rather go down to Venice Beach go ass surfing and, and see the hottest chicks in the world than sit in the center block room and make up imaginary shit. I, I'm assuming other people feel the same. So for me, it was, you go in here, you shut the door, you go to work. And you know, people ask a lot about like how much, you know, how much time is you know, during the day. I'm a four to six hour guy. And that means I can give you a good four to six hours. I'm talking about normally, you know, you don't have like a deadline, a super crazy deadline or whatever. Four to six hours. And I'm done. I, I'm at a point in my career where I understand the point of diminishing returns. It's funny because we talked about this in my class on Sunday. We all know when we're doing good work, and then there's a gray area where we don't, it doesn't feel like the best work, but it still feels like usable work. And then there's the vanishing point where we really don't know how good or bad the work is. Sure, surefire sign, you're in that, that gray zone, uh, you get giddy. You start giggling about stuff you're writing. Uh, ideas that seem profound are really unworkable and, and half thought. So it's really about, you can spin your wheels for 10 hours. But what I found is if you give yourself an honest four to six every day that you know you're doing high energy work and you're, you're really focused on it, you're not taking breaks, you're not on the internet, um, set a goal for yourself, four to six, and you're done. One trick, and again, we talked about this Sunday. One trick is, Let's say you get in the office at 11 o'clock. Because we're writers, we're, hopefully we're not up at the crack of dawn, we need to sleep in a little bit. So if I say to myself, all right, I'm working until five o'clock today. What that immediately does is, it sets parameters so I know that, hey man, you got six hours. And by looking at the clock, you know like, I need to turn the tempo up, or hey, I'm doing just fine. But knowing, and, and I mean, you stick by, like at five o'clock, I'm, I'm out of here today. So what that does for me, every writer is different. What it does for me is it helps me maintain the proper tempo. If I start to drift or I spend too much time on a certain passage, hey, we all know what that's about. Dude, I, I spent three hours once writing one sentence. You know, and I'm not bragging. <laughs> you, you get lost in it. So that reminds you, hey, dude, I only got two hours left. We'll come back to this, whatever. But I'm really a stickler on 
disciplining that time that you're going to be writing and doing it in an environment where you can really focus on the writing. Um, for me, the big thing that's in the book that if I've had one genius idea about writing in my entire life, it's the time card. Um, people, I get emails from people all over the country that have read my book and they all say, well, I read this thing about the time card and I didn't, really, eh, I didn't think it was that great and then I did it and holy shit, I mean, it really works. It's such a simple idea and I, I can't even tell you when I came up with it. I just set up a Word document called Time Card and when I go in, I put the date, I put my start time, I put my finish time for the day. If I take an hour off for lunch, I'll put a minus one in there, you know, an hour off for lunch. But what it does, when you keep a time card, the time card never lies. And so the beauty is, let's say you went and you worked 11 to 3 and then you went surfing. Alright, that's 4, so you give yourself a 4. Okay, the next day, hey man, two good hours, ah, but then I had a pitch meeting. I didn't really make it back to the office, so that's a two. So as you start going through, you, you can look at the time card and you'll know, how come I don't have more pages? Oh, I'll tell you why. Two, one, one, two, zero. That's why. It's amazing because I use it as either like, um, you know, a, as, a, as a baseball bat to hit myself with and say, dude, you're fucking up. You've been in here six days and you got a total of six hours. That's not going to get it done. I say that to myself with that same voice, by the way, in case you're wondering. That same authoritarian drill. So, on the other hand, you can look at it and say, hey, man, look, I'm doing good. I'm doing good time. I'm averaging. And this is how far I take it. I take the calculator out and I'll average out my daily rate. And at the end of each time card, I actually run the numbers to tell myself how many hours a day did I average? How many pages did that yield? How many total hours spent? It, this sounds totally academic and just stupid. Dude, it's a, it's a mind-blowing exercise in maximizing your productivity because you can't lie to yourself when you see it in black and white. And I, I've used it ever since, I've got it for years now, and it always tells me, hey, you're doing okay, keep this pace, you'll be fine. Because remember, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Hey, you're doing good work, stick with it, or you're fucking up, you need to turn up the heat, bro. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a guy, it says this in the book, but I also like to put a little comment like the, the hours, okay, total hours. I always put a comment like what the day was like. And you know, the, the good days, which are fewer and further between, I'll write like solid day or kicking ass, you know? But the bad days, and there are more of those, it says like, you're fucking up, or you know, who are you kidding? You're an imposter, you know? I, I like to give myself that extra little needling. But I tell you, if you use a time card, I have seen this happen dozens of times with students, with other people I know. It's the simplest idea in the world and it forces your feet to the fire and it will show you what you need to do to get it done. I guarantee you that it's impossible not to keep a time card and not have it help you. Again, it sounds really basic, but it, it's a genius idea. And, and really, let's face it, if, you know, as writers, we have an ocean of time to manage. Especially if you do it professionally, that's your job, that's your only job. You can blow off 16 hours in the blink of an eye. These days you go on the internet and you're on there four hours. It started as 15 minutes. It's so important to manage our time and this little device, the time card, gets that done for you. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to comment on, and now that I've listened to you, it makes a little bit more sense, but when someone says a routine, um, to me that, that kind of usually means like writing at a specific time of day and stuff. Yeah. But when I looked at your actual time sheet, and this was just a small sample, so it doesn't, so maybe right. just, but your time sheet, you actually did not seem to be writing at the same time every day. It was very no. scattered. To me, the, the time, you know, if you looked at that in the book, there's a sample time card to show you what I'm talking about. Um, if you looked at the run of it, it there would be a lot more 10.30, 11 o'clock starts, because that's me. Okay. Um, but a lot of times, like, you have real life stuff to do, so you gotta start in the afternoon or whatever. For me, it's not necessarily the exact same time, it's more about the space doing it in the exact same space. In the book, I mentioned the Joseph Campbell thing about sacred space. Um, everyone's different. I mean, I've written, uh, I've written scripts in coffee shops. Um, I wrote the book in a boba tea shop. I've also written in my office or at home. It's about a sacred space for whatever project you're working on. So for me, the sameness of the space establishes the ritual psychologically. When I'm in this space, I'm writing. Right? So that, that's the idea because there's a certain, it brings a certain seriousness to the process. Hey, if you write over here and you write over there, look, some writers, I, look, every writer's different. For me, I want to know when I'm in this space, I'm doing serious work and serious business. 
I'm sure you could write 20 minutes here, go over to Pinkberry, write 20 minutes over there. That's just not my take. But I really think finding a space, I have a student that has a coffee shop that like, it's a little teeny coffee shop in uh, Silver Lake. I don't even know the name of it, but like, there's like three seats in the joint. He goes in there, that's his space. He gets his work done. It's perfect because he's out of the house. So you don't feel claustrophobic. I like a little white noise. I don't know about you when you write. Um, I like having people moving around and if the noise isn't good for me, I'll just put in the earbuds. But, you know, lockdown is tough. So, you know, a library, like in college, I don't know, did you study in the library? I never studied there. I was too quiet for me. I need a little, little noise. Whatever it is, find a space and, and say, okay, when I'm here, it's work. You know, it, it, this sounds so simple, but really, I mean, it's hard, right? As a writer, it's like, yeah. it's hard to get your ass in the chair, man. That was one thing that Oliver Stone line, uh, writing equals ass plus chair. You know, he had that on his desk for years, and it, it's totally true, man. How hard is it some days to get your ass in the chair? It's hard. It's hard, man. Yeah, yeah. W one thing, I just, this is a kind of a, just a quick question. Have you ever added up, like, just from, you know, an idea concept to first draft, how many hours it takes to write a script? Um, okay, well, so I usually do scripts in two. There's two. There's the pre-production side. There's the, the planning of the script and the writing of the script. Approximately 220 hours writing, which is eight weeks, four to six hours a day. Um, again, everyone's different. Everyone works differently. And ultimately, by the way, working 300 hours doesn't make you more of a man than <laughs> working 200. Okay. It's the right hours. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then how, much, like, how much is in this in this just the planning stage? The planning I'd say planning. I'd say they're equal. I'd say four to eight weeks planning, and that means at the end of that month to two months, your your beat sheet, your note cards, which then translate into a beat sheet. A lot of times people ask, me, "Oh, what's a beat sheet?" All the beat sheet is is you lock your note cards and then you write what those are onto paper, so you can have a document right there at the computer with you instead of sorting through your note cards. So, Four to eight weeks to get that beat sheet bulletproof. In other words, you look at it, hey man, I, all the holes, the logic issues, I, I think I've fixed that as well as I can, time to write. In terms of writing, eight weeks. Contractually, you get anywhere between eight and 12 weeks on a studio feature. Uh, I've never taken more than eight weeks and I've never been late in my life. But as you can tell, I mean, I take it pretty seriously. Like when I'm on, that's all I do. Um, which isn't necessarily healthy either. You know, you could probably spend a little more time in the sunshine. Yeah. But so I'd say a month to two months to plan it and then two months to write it. I, and I think that's very important for people to to hear because so many people are like 90% writing and 10% planning and, and that planning stage is just so, so important. I, I don't think you could, I, I don't think you can emphasize anything more important than what you just said. It, it's, you get out of it what you put into it and if you don't pre-produce that script and figure it all out beforehand. I'm not saying you eliminate any chance for fun stuff to happen, the happy accidents while you're writing. I'm saying you better have that story locked because the way I always look at it is that it's kind of like you, you know a map through the jungle. This step sheet, this beat sheet, that's your map. And if you get off it, you wander off under the jungle, sometimes they never find you again. Sometimes the cannibals get you. You know, It's like stick to this beat sheet, you'll be okay. What that means is you have to do all that. Um, the the beat sheet stuff has to be done to your you know to your specification before you start, and then you got to stick to it. That doesn't mean you won't call audibles, change this, change that. Realize these scenes need to flip. But if you venture into a screenplay without a hundred percent step sheet, doom is inevitable. Man, how many people do you know they have fifty or sixty pages of a script and they flatline? They didn't think it through. Hey, man, anybody can write a, a cool first act. Yeah, sure, right on. The, the problem is you need another 90 pages. So plan it all the way out. It's better to spend more time on the front end and wait to write than just start writing. And, and we can all agree, look, we want to start writing, man. We want to start doing all the cool shit we have in our heads. If you don't plan it out, you're dead. You're dead. Well, one of the things I found, too, is it's very... Doing that planning stages, you have days where you feel like nothing was accomplished. Oh, yeah. Whereas when you're actually writing pages, you have a nice page count to look at. Um, so it's just demoralizing. To, and that's part, that, I think part you of You hit the key word, demoralizing. It's demoralizing. I mean, what's so funny, you read a lot of stuff. And, that, you know, writing the book was kind of a reaction to that too, which is everyone makes it sound like you show up and you're at the top of Mount Olympus and you're just channeling 
you know, the, the manna from heaven. It's like, dude, writing can be demoralizing. It, it, you can spend a whole day working on something, still not crack it and have nothing to show for it. And you feel like shit. And, I, and that's part of the writing process too. It's just part of the process that you have to understand. Not every day is going to be a winner, but you need those days. Those are the days that push you to the day that you do crack it. You know, it's, it's interesting. I remember there was a project that I worked on and I came upon, I was probably 20 pages in, it was a studio job at Universal, and I got about 20 pages in and suddenly a, a logic issue popped up that I hadn't seen before. It was like an oh shit moment. Like, oh fuck, that doesn't make any sense now. So I literally had to stop writing and I spent a week cracking it, how to fix it. And by the grace of God, at the end of that week, I had cracked it and it made the whole thing even better. But that's an ugly feeling to realize that, ooh, dude, structurally, we have a big issue here. There was no choice but to hit the brakes, go back to the cards and get those things worked out. And it was, it was worth its weight in gold. It's worth the time. What you said is right. Do all the planning, all the note carding, all the beach eating and get that shit right. It makes your climb so much easier, man. The shit is hard. You know, anyone that thinks writing is easy, I, I, I probably don't want to read whatever they've written. Um, it's hard, man. It's, it's, think about it. You're, you beat yourself up terribly. There's no exit. It's you and you. And you're fighting the white elephant, the blank page, to get to express what you're trying to express. And this shit is hard, man. There's rough days. There's days you feel like shit. There's days you feel like an asshole, an imposter. I just see there's a preponderance of, of happiness when people talk about writing in a lot of articles, interviews and stuff, and maybe they just know something I don't know, but in my experience, it's blue collar work, man, it's hard. It's really hard. So just accept, hey, it's gonna be a rough, it's gonna be a rough go. And ultimately, what, what you find is, the things you think are terrible, if you give them time before you edit them, you realize, hey, actually, it's not that bad. Actually, this will work. During that given day, you know, man. You look at a page, you're like, I should just destroy this and get on with my life. I'm just not, I'm not a good enough. And later, you come back a week later, oh, that's not that bad, I'll punch it up here. And that's really one thing, objectivity is at a premium. Uh, one thing I, we concentrated last week on class, one trick that took me years to learn, maybe some people already know it, never edit the pages you wrote on the same day you wrote them. Do not finish your day, finish the scene as best you can for the day, and just put the gun down and walk away. I shredded, God knows how many pages. I just, you know, it's like I'm six hours in, I'm starting to burn out a little bit, just not happy with it, start tinkering with it. Oops, it's an hour and a half later and I've just disemboweled. What was an okay scene before is now shambles. Just leave it, come back. Minimum a day, but really, if you, what I found is if you write stuff, best you can that day, leave it. If you come back a week or longer later, you're, first of all, it will appear much better than you thought it was. Second of all, it's much easier to, to punch up because you have fresh eyes on it and you can take the raw materials there and really take them to that next level. Trying to edit the day you write is just a fool's errand. I, I, God knows how many years I did that until I realized, dude, just leave it, come back. That, you don't have to finish it to perfection today. There's plenty of time, man. It's, it's a long haul. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this next section, um, I, I have some like questions myself about this. You talk about voiceover in the, um, in, in the <laughs> book, and I started writing a script, and it has elements of film noir. So I'm just saying it because you said that film noir. It's the golden so, age yeah, of voiceover. So, so, yeah. yeah. So okay, and, and just coincidentally, I put on Sunset Boulevard last night on Netflix. I started watching that, and I mean, it's nothing but voiceover. So right. I just I want to get and I, and you mentioned um, Taxi Driver, The Usual Suspects. Um, there are clearly films where voiceover works spectacularly, without a doubt. Unfortunately, you know, usually you're not writing one of those films. <laughs> that's really the problem. And by the way, the chapter is called "Voiceover Sucks." Yes, yeah, let's, yeah, let's yeah. be clear. And about so, that. I, and so, I want to just get a a because you spend a lot of time exactly voiceover sucks when not to use it. But maybe you can talk a little bit about when it might be a good idea to use it. Um, and like one of the things that I keep hearing 
I'm in a writer's group, and almost, I mean, I presented this script, it had the voiceover, it got lamb blasted. I knew it was, because every time someone puts a voiceover in, up in the writer's group, it gets lamb blasted. Right. And one <laughs> thought that has occurred to me, though, is that I feel like, in some ways, people are just regurgitating what they've heard from you and other screenwriting professionals. Don't use voiceover. I feel, right. I, I feel so, like so does voiceover have a bad rap? That, yeah, that's yeah, what you're saying, yeah, right. exactly. And so, and it's like, I, basically what I'm doing is, it's gonna, it's gonna like, like a film war, but we're, or, you you know, I, I'm trying to remember the exact book. Like Raymond Chandler, you know, there was, he'd start out with kind of a, a voiceover at the beginning and then a voiceover at the end. And it's just kind of, it, it bookends the, the okay. script. So I'm just trying to get a feel for when would be an appropriate time to use one. Or maybe there's some, some examples where you think it worked really well. I pulled out Christmas Story. I mentioned I had two young kids. For some reason, my two-year-old daughter has gotten into Christmas Story. I've seen it literally a hundred times in the last wow. two months. And again, there's nothing but voiceover. One of the things that always comes up in the writer's group is, is it's, oh, well, we're not really learning anything new through the voiceover and, and the big thing that you talk about is you know show don't tell is that voiceover is a crutch and stuff it's like but it's like with Christmas story Goodfellas is another one Goodfellas does something and I'd be curious to get your take on this Goodfellas do something really strange if you watch it about halfway through the movie just for about five minutes the voiceover switches to the wife and you actually get the right. wife's take right, yeah. and it's really it's, it's frankly it's a little weird and, and it is all weird. But, but since it's a masterpiece, we, yeah, we, we yeah, roll exactly, with it. Yeah. Exactly. So, so just well, and here's what I would say in general. I mean, obviously, there, there are many instances where voiceover works like a charm or may even be essential. I mean, there is no apocalypse now without the voiceover. I mean, taxi driver, absolutely essential. And, and you know, but we're, we're taking kind of the, the highest end efforts here. The reality I find is that at, as an aspiring writer or younger writer, People are using voiceover as a crutch to, to kind of caulk the story holes. And the reality is, it was interesting, you know, Blade Runner, the studio forced the, you know, the, the voiceover on, on the original Blade Runner and took 20 years or whatever. Finally, they took it off. The Ridley Scott, you know, director's cut, they took it off. It's a much better movie. Um, I don't think many people are even arguing that. But, but usually use voiceover to get people over holes in the story or stuff that's not 100% plausible and you're trying to sell it even better. I think one case voiceover is probably necessary is source material like a book, etc. that kind of demands it. So Goodfellas is a great example because it was a real life story. Um, you know, when they did it, it was good to use Henry's voice and it, it really accentuated the story in ways that it couldn't have done otherwise. Um, the real question is if you strip voiceover off of something, does it still tell the story appropriately? That's really the litmus test. If I take this away, do I still get the same story? And that tells you, essentially, are you using voiceover to do the heavy lifting of the story? Or does this color it or accentuate it in a way that's unique and, and um, an addition to the content. And in the book, we, you know, I talk briefly about film noir, which is considered the golden age of voiceover. You know, what was so great about that is for the first time they were exploring the insides of the characters, these post-World War II, you know, uh, disillusioned vets that had seen horrifying stuff, living in, in strange times, etc. Et no one had gotten into that new darkness the noir of it all that these, these characters had inside. And so voiceover was one way to do that. If you watch, I'm a huge noir fan, but if you watch them, generally the, those voices are, are emotional. Although you watch Raw Deal, which I'm a huge fan of, one of the all-time greats, it's really interesting. It's, it's a voiceover of an obsessed woman um, who has sprung a convict from prison trying to help him get away. And she's so obsessed with him, she'd even help him with a prison break. But as the story starts to go sideways, her jealousy, sexual jealousy, comes out. That's fundamentally different than most 90 plus percent of today's voiceover, which is just telling the story or telling you what you're already seeing on screen. So the reason I bring it up is... And, and I want to be clear, Goodfellas, I watched that like within the last month because I was writing this movie um, and I, I, I'm watching, there's like literally a scene in the beginning where he says something about, you know, yeah, I was hanging out with the guys across the street at the coffee shop. They were, it's like, that's the voiceover. And then the next scene is we see him hanging out with the guys across the street at the coffee shop or the barbershop or whatever it was. And it's like, that does exactly what you just said though. Right, in, in the beginning, as you follow the movie, you'll notice it becomes much, much more surgical. It's, um, I, here's what I think, I've never done this, so this is all new to me. I think you could strip the voiceover off Goodfellas Absolutely. and it, it would Good. still totally yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. I, I think where it's really important is getting more in the mechanics of the mob in how, you know, um, Paul Servino 
gets the message from him, who gets the message from him, who gets it from the teller. It's hard to get that stuff across. I think what's interesting, if you watch Casino, that's an example of the voiceover doing the heavy lifting. Not, it's not as artful as Goodfellas, and it ends up taking over the movie. So look, there's always gonna be exceptions that you're gonna go, yeah, we need voiceover. I would argue that those are few and far between, and that if a writer's using voiceover, um, they're probably not telling the story through, again, show me, don't tell me. You should be able to tell pretty much any story without it. Again, there's always exceptions, mm -hmm. but for younger writers especially, you find like, you know what, I'm having trouble telling this story in traditional screenwriting, why don't I just tell them? That's not good for a young writer. For, and as I mentioned in the book, it's not good for a lot of reasons. One is which it, it stunts your screenwriting. If you're gonna use a crutch, it's like, cool, what do they call that thing, the ladies helper? <laughs> you know, if you use the ladies helper with my friends, you're gonna get bitched out, you're gonna be, you're gonna be sodomized. So, so it's, it's, don't use it unless it's absolutely essential. Here's the thing, we can always find a brilliant example where it works. Uh, Birdman used it exquisitely. I mean, think about it, Birdman is so surgical with its voiceover, uh, and I'm a huge fan of the film, it's, it's hard not to be, but you can't assume that you're at the Birdman, Goodfellas, taxi driver level. You gotta assume that your writing isn't quite there yet. So my advice is write the story without voiceover um, any chance you get. If ultimately you find because of the source material or whatever you need to add some fine, but don't use it as a crutch. That's, and again, like I said in the book, executives kind of blow through the voiceover, man. That's, it's a cheat and they know that. Is the movie here on the page without the voiceover? That's the standard each writer should probably ask themselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just want to talk briefly about, um, you go, you mentioned this before, you go very deeply into training day, and um, I think that's an excellent section. Um, I highly recommend that people check that out in the book. I'm someone who learns by just example, like theoretical stuff is not so valuable to me, but actually seeing examples and seeing what a professional screenwriter thinks of those pages was very valuable. And obviously you really like this script. Are there some other scripts that you out there that you recommend? Obviously you really like Training Day, but maybe just mention some modern script, you know, two or three modern mm -hmm. scripts that you would say, hey, make sure you read these scripts because they're really excellent. And, and you know, the people at home can try and break them down themselves. Right, I mean, you know, the, the, some of the Andy Kevin Walker stuff is great. I mean, Seven is, is fucking amazing. Um, and you could do the exact same exercise. I mean, essentially the exercise in the book is just taking training day, the first act of training day, and note carding it out, and then discussing what each scene accomplishes. That's all it is. The reason I chose training day is because it's so simple on screen, but so deep in terms of what it's accomplishing, that it makes an excellent example and really shows people. I think some people feel like, um, you know, like when you put your first note card down, it says opening car crash, that's great. But eventually, you're probably going to need more detail than that. So when it says husband and wife argue, we're going to need to know the sub. That's a great starting point, but we need to mine those subtexts. And so that's what that exercise of training day shows us. Stuff you don't even know is actually mechanically important in accomplishing stuff is actually mechanically important in accomplishing stuff. Seven is a great one. I'm a huge Fight Club fan. Uh, I haven't broken all these down. Uh, I think I'm going to start doing Prisoners. Did you see Prisoners? No. Everyone says that. You know what? That movie, to me, that movie, what? It's exceptionally dark, and the subject matter is exceptionally I think I dark. Did read the script. It was about a little girl who gets. Kidnapped. There's two little girls who get kidnapped. Yeah, I, I read the script. I it, the it's movie. a fantastic script, fantastic movie. I think the subject matter kind of kept people away from it. It was released a little earlier in the year. It, for whatever, it didn't get its due. I think I'm going to break that one down because that has some extremely subtle storytelling that, nonetheless, is, is mechanically very effective. But at the, at the end of the day. Every movie, let, let me qualify that, every good movie, you should be able to do what I did with Training Day, which is break down the first act and then see everything. Every, there are no accidents in a great screenplay. Every line counts. Uh, which is, look, we all know, sometimes you're writing the lines just to kind of fill the, the scene. It's like great screenplays don't have accidents. They don't have throw away this, throw away that. Everything is measured and precise. And training day is just great because like one line in there, you look at it and later realize how big an impact it has. So take any movie you love, especially, and, and you know, part of this is if you're gonna write a cop movie, break down some of the great cop movies. Um, everyone who's an aspiring writer, when they have a movie that's a good paradigm for them to work on a spec from or whatever, obviously you're not gonna lift it beat for beat, but find that movie that's really relevant to your project and do exactly what we did with training day, which is, Break it down, scene by scene, and ask yourself, okay, what's being accomplished here? What's the point of this scene? Why does the character say that? 
Is this just a random description or is that description really set the tone or tell me something I need to know about what's going on? It's amazing how deep even the simplest, uh, apparently simplest uh, films go, even romantic comedies. So it's a great exercise. I, I hope when people read it and they read the training day thing, then they use that same device on movies they're working on. Say uh, Legally Blonde is somehow germane to your spec. Same level of detail. It's not genre specific, man. It's all good, solid movies. Yeah, yeah, so it, it's sure. just fun to do too when you realize like it's so good that you didn't even notice they were doing it. You know, that, that's the high art. Like, wow, David Ayer is just doing stuff. I had no idea he was doing it. And it's humbling, man. It's humbling for me. I've written 29, 30 features. I mean, you know, sometimes you look at stuff people are doing, like Birdman, and you're like, I, I remember watching Birdman the first time just going, I wish I was man enough. <laughs> to have fought up a bird man. I mean, it's humbling. American Beauty is another classic to break down. So much is going on there, but because it's a suburban white setting, it seems kind of, um, you know, just kind of easily paced. And then you break it down like training, you break it down beat by beat. Man, heavy shit is going on in that movie. Definitely American Beauty is another one you want to read and, and check out. But it, it, you can see how excited I get just thinking about, God, they're. You know, these guys are building better mousetraps. I want to do one of those, you know? And if you find your cards aren't going that deep, that probably means you need to work on your car. Work on your car. Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Um, so, again, this is something <clears throat> I always like to ask screenwriters about this and kind of get their take. You mentioned Blake Snyder several times in the book. Um, and a couple I, times, yeah. A couple times. I, I find um, most successful screenwriters really scoff at him and, and sort of that rigid, formulaic approach. Um, what's your take on Blake Snyder? Maybe you can just tell us what you think of him. Here's my take on Blake Snyder. Blake and I had the same agent for a while. Um, it's funny because when the book came out, um, I got a few hate emails from people saying um, one of the one of the mail out said uh, just saving the cat isn't enough to build a professional screenwriting career. And I didn't even think twice about it because it seems self-evident to me that it takes more than just understand plotting to build a career. There's the stuff my book talks about, which is meetings and all this kind of stuff. So I got a couple emails from people that were very passionate um, saying, uh, you're disrespecting Blake and this and that, which was fascinating to me having known Blake very briefly and having the same agent to have a guy in Timbuktu telling me who actually knew Blake that I'm disrespecting him. And I said, you know what? Check out the book, man. Tell, show me where I'm disrespecting him. It's, it's not disrespect. I think what happened is, uh, you know, Blake was a high concept guy. His scripts are shamelessly high concept and very successful in a late 80s, early 90s context. God bless him. Um, I think what it is is his book really touched uh, people emotionally. It's kind of one of the paramount books that made it accessible to people who want to know more about it, have always wanted to know more about it, uh, but just didn't know where to start. It's a, it's a, what I think in tribute to the book, it makes it very easy for the layman, for the civilian, to start to understand what screenwriting is. And I think that's awesome. I mean, you know, I mean, who, who can argue that? That's awesome. Um, I think people took that book to heart in a way that screenwriting books don't generally affect people because they're generally a little more literary or however you want to put it. Um, I, I don't think, how do you bash Save the Cat? It, if it helps anybody get a start, then it's worth its weight in gold. I think the, the blowback is, it is formulaic. Remember, Blake sold high concept comedies. He wasn't writing American Beauty, he was writing Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. So I think, I think the real thing is for some writers, they scoff at it given what Blake actually sold and given Blake's um, enjoyment of opening this world up to aspiring writers. And so I, I think there's just a little hater vibe to people that consider themselves um, experienced writers or better writers. Um, kind of like, you know, don't let the riffraff in. You know, we're the serious guys. I don't want the housewives reading about it. But how do you argue a book that opened up the world to a lot of people that may not ever have investigated I mean, I have nothing but positive things to say about it. The, the, my only point is my book is a very different book. If you think this is going to be along the Save the Cat line, as you can attest, you're going to get a whole, a whole different message out of it. But how do you argue anything? It's, it's like I say in there, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of script consultants, largely because I feel like they haven't proven themselves. I'm an old school guy. I'm the guy that you won a championship, then you got the big contract. Now you pay for potential in pro sports. 
You give the 19-year-old kid $100 million hoping he'll be a Kobe or a Magic Johnson at some point. So for me, it's, um, you know, I, I think that anything that gets you fired up, anything that points you in the right direction, anything that has any amount of content that keeps you moving forward is great. Script consultants tend largely to not have the credentials, in my humble opinion, that mean that they're any better at it than anyone else per se. When, it's interesting because I didn't really pay much attention to the cottage industry around screenwriting until I started writing my book. And then I went, oh, there's about a million books on screenwriting. But then I started to look a little deeper and it's like, you know, the number of books written guys by guys that have produced credits or have worked in the studio system is so small. I mean, infinitesimal. You have guys like, he won the Texas Alternative Film Festival in 1995. I don't think that makes him an expert on writing Hollywood screenplays. So you can tell in the book, there's a little indignance, like, you know, it, because it's unregulated, because you don't have to get a permit from the city of Santa Monica to do it. I, I don't know if you know this, but massage therapists now have to be licensed. So there's a, it really it's to make more money for Santa Monica, but at least now you know someone passed the, the, the most basic test so they know what they're doing. We, we don't have that in screenwriting. So basically any joker anywhere can write a book about screenwriting. Does that make them qualified to do so? I, I really don't think so. So hopefully when you read the book, you saw like, there's certain experience from people who have done it, lived and died by it, you know, made their livelihood at it, that can't be replicated theoretically or by rehashing the note cards. Um, so for me, I would rather have a book by a guy like Blake who actually lived the business than some of these titles I see where guys are like, what are your qualifications, man? I, I don't get it. How do you know? And, and what I then noticed was, to blather on further, was, man, some of these prices are crazy, man. I mean, you're seeing like you get three to five pages of notes for $600. And then you think like, okay, so, oh, and you, but you know what? For $150, you get one to two pages. So I'm like, all right, so how does that work? Does that mean you're holding back the good notes unless I purchase the $600 version? Or you only kind of half think it through for the 150? It's like, it's so arbitrary. How do you price notes that way? It's absurd. And also, do these notes help? And, and my experience with my students is, a lot of them tell me, I'm not gonna name drop, there's just certain places they go to get notes done or story consultants read them, and they're ultimately just not very useful. They're kind of knee-jerk, like bottom-level studio notes, but they're not prescriptive. Hey man, you and I, we can take any script and go, you know what, the lead character sucks. Okay, but how do we fix the lead character? So getting notes alone, I don't think is gonna help you with your problem. You need not only someone to diagnose it, but then be prescriptive. And that's really what the class is about, and hopefully what the book will help with, which is, okay, great, it doesn't work. How do I fix it? Paying a guy 600 bucks, to tell you it doesn't work, doesn't help you. And, and again, how qualified are they? What have they done? There are some people, hey man, they worked at CBS. They, they worked at Sony. They did notes for big producers for years or, or whatever. God bless. I'm always wary of the people that haven't done it themselves. As I said in the book, the quote that sticks with me, there's no expert like someone who's never done it. You know, don't, man, this shit is expensive. $600 is a lot of money. Don't give that money away to someone who can't really help you. Be more selective. And look, you're never going to eliminate the cottage industry around screenwriting any more than you would with acting. There's always going to be a guy giving a bogus acting class or shooting shitty headshots. I'm just trying to tell people in the book, you know, be wise about what you spend your money on. Don't assume people are going to be able to help you unless they can prove they can help you. You know? Obviously, I'm very passionate about it. I just get a little bit out of shape when I see some of these people. It's like, what the fuck do you know? Really, seriously, what do you know? And there's no answer for that. There, hey, if I look at, you know, co-writer, Raging Bull, Citizen Kane, a pocket, great, hey man, let me get that book, right? But, but it's not that, it's like, he teaches it, Texas U, and Brian. really, is that it? Never been in the deep water, never, you know? It's like the soldier who's been in combat versus the guy working in the stock room back in the States, it's that kind of, who do you want to know from? Personally, I want to hear the battle shit, I want to hear what happens on the ground, you know? Yeah. So Blake, Blake, Blake Snyder, and I'd just be curious to dig in a little bit. How much do you use, like, you know, his beats or I don't, you know, I don't, the I've read point, the catalyst, the you know, the the look, you know, lost. Ultimately, you know, Blake's book is kind of a more user friendly version of the books like Sid Field Screenplay, which preceded. It's all kind of the same mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's uh, 
I don't personally use it. I, Sidfield Screenplay was the only screenplay book I ever read, and thank God I found it, uh, like millions of other people. Um, I don't really, I think there's a, certain terms he uses that are equal to other terms that are easily understood. I'm not a Save the Cat guy, but I go out of my way not to slam Save the Cat because he did find a great way to, to there's a lexicon he uses that is really helpful for people, especially that don't have time in the business. And you got to remember, like you moved out here, I moved out here. Not everybody can move out here or wants to move out here. So it's a great shorthand. Any book like that that gets you turned on to what the mechanics are, great. You know, I, I'm a huge Sid Field fan just because it's so straightforward and, and really, it's, it's also, remember, it was written originally in 1979. So it kind of has that old Hollywood vibe to it, you know, the way he talks and stuff. I, I just, I love it. But there's many other books that, you know, have it. Okay, so let's, um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and kind of talk about just some of the things that you talked about in your book just in terms of your career. And the first thing I want to talk about, and I think this was such an important I think it's an important story for people to hear that are trying to break in. You you retell this story of a, a chubby French director. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not French, it's European. Of a European um, <laughs> director. And he keeps he keeps telling you monkey hairs, you know, there's a, and, um, you know, it's maybe you could quickly just right. tell us the story and then we'll dig into sort of the bigger meaning of that story because the the sad reality is that's not a unique story. That's the, right. that's the problem with that story is that um, it's not something that whoa look what happened to John, it's right. like, that's the repeated process that screenwriters face if they want to have a real career. And, and sometimes, I mean, the, the higher your ascent, the, the bigger the people you're working with almost ensure a cartoonish flavor because of who they are. And like in this case, I mean, the chapter's called What is All These Monkey Hairs? Um, and essentially, it's, it's, a, it's everything in there is true, but you know, it, it's uh, a very famous European director, I'm cutting to the chase here, comes in and just starts pulling shit out of his ass and pitches something that if you were at a coffee shop with your friends and they pitched it, you would laugh them out of the room. Uh, because this person was an internationally renowned director, people did not do that. I was on the verge of doing that. Um, but really, you know, it comes down to, at that point in my life, I just worked with Jeffrey Katzenberg, with Joel Silver. So when I got hired to save that movie, you know, I was like, let's rock and roll, man. I just come off two awesome world-class producers. So when I knew I was gonna work with this this director who made one film in particular I'm a huge fan of, uh, I was super pumped. I'm thinking, this is, this is it, man, the trilogy, the triumvirate, you know, the great producer, the great director. And it just turned out to the exact opposite. The guy was a buffoon. And, and what's funny about it is, you know, look, sometimes it's somebody's not having their best day or you're not having your best day so you don't see them accurately. Subsequently over the years, I've seen this person be a buffoon in several other contexts. So it turns out they actually are a buffoon. But really what the story is about is sitting in a room and hearing shit that's just absurd and learning to surf that as a writer in terms of not only your reactions in the room, but subsequently what you do with the notes that you get. Then that really, it's fun to read the story, but the message for that story was more about, I made a mistake in that I was a young writer, uh, I was finally in the big leagues, really starting to feel it, um, and I beat myself to death trying to make that project work, um, not understanding that a lot of it's just silliness and fiction and notes that people won't remember. That's one thing that, that I found through my career, like you'll have a, a, someone advance a note and the moment as a writer you hear the note, you panic. You're like, oh fuck, that'll fuck up the whole script. You don't, hopefully you don't say, say that. But so it's like, what I found is a lot of times, I mean, it's in the book. My response is always, you give me a note I hate. Let's change the, the lead as a man into a woman. I already hate that idea. So what I usually do is just like this. I go, well, you know what, that's a big note. Let me think about that, um, and I'll get back to it. Let me put my brain on it, think about it, and, and let's talk about it again. And then nine out of 10 times, what you realize is next story meeting, they don't remember giving you that note. It's not that important of a note. That doesn't mean you don't have to consider it in case they do call you on it. But what I found is a lot of times, think how easy it is for an executive. They just have to fill the day. They can just throw notes out. Because you know, you're the one that actually has to make sense of it. And a lot of times they're just throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. With the really good producers, believe me, they know their shit. So it's like when they give you ideas, you want to think about it. But generally it's not just reacting to bad notes. It's 
you know, acknowledging that the note has been put out there, which is just being respectful, and then dealing with the note appropriately. The bad notes tend to go away on their own, and do your homework. Figure out, like, if someone calls you on it again, what's the answer? Shy of just going, that's terrible, which, which I did for years in the beginning of my career. That's the worst goddamn note I've ever heard, you know. So, the, the thing you gotta remember is these people ultimately, if they could do what you do, they'd be doing it. Despite all the bullshit, they need you. And so they're trying to help. Some are better helpers than others. Some are just lousy helpers. But really think through what's being said, if you can make it work, if you should make it work. And then as a writer, treat yourself a little better than, than I did at the time, which I just went, you know, I went down the rabbit hole. I, I physically and psychologically exhausted myself. Um, psychologically battered my girlfriend <laughs> you know just I was just terrible I took it so seriously only to realize later like dude 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 you went too far a bridge too far nobody else has taken it that seriously the the crazy Euro director wasn't taking it that seriously none of the execs were taking it that seriously you gotta keep some balance to what what's going on there I think when people read the story they'll get a better sense of that but really the, the note is you're gonna see some crazy shit and it makes great stories later. Um, just keep in mind, you know, you always hear that thing about Hinduism, like Hindus see uh, life as a game. You know, there's like the puppet master moving the streets. It's all one big game. Hollywood's a great way, you know, Hollywood's a business where using the Hindu approach to those meetings really helps. Hey man, this is all just a game. That doesn't mean you don't take it seriously and you don't write your ass off. It means don't take this shit personally, man. It's just a cartoon, you know, and it can be a very lucrative mm -hmm. cartoon. So I just and, and as a, that's sort of like some great tactical advice how to how to how to um, navigate those sorts of meetings. I wanted to take a step back. My dad used to tell this story where it's during the depression. A poor guy goes up to a rich guy, knocks on the door, and says, um, "Hey, can you give me a job?" The rich guy says, "Sure, go in the backyard, dig a hole." He digs a hole. Go comes back the next year. Hey, man, you got another job? The rich guy says, "Sure, go in the back and fill the hole in." He fills in the hole. He comes back the next day. He says, hey, man, you got a job for me? Sure, go dig another right. hole. And so he says, no. No matter how much money, no matter how much money he's and how bad, bad things are, he just says no. And there's like this certain, certain you know, moment where it just, you know, people want to feel like they're actually doing something right. that does have some meaning and some value, no matter how straight up. And it's like, to me, that's what the monkey hair story is boiled down to at some point you must have realized that this thing was never going to see the light of the day how do you get up for those meetings and how do you continue to write your ass right. like it's, you it's very it's very when, difficult when it's, yeah. it's you know it's never going to go anywhere and and what can you do to get over those it's meetings? an excellent point and you know my, my take is simply this it, it's got to become a matter of pride for yourself if no one else in other words don't you become a shithead because everyone else is being a shithead. Find your own, take personal pride in trying to make, no matter how difficult the assignment or how silly some of the material seems, whatever, do it for out of personal pride. Do it to, sh to not only sharpen your own skill set. Dude, it's hard to spin shit into gold. You know, and th that's a great skill set to have. But, but understand, it really doesn't matter if these other people are taking it serious or not. I've been paid good money and I'm gonna take it seriously. I'm gonna do the very best I can. So even if it's, if it's a dog shit project, when someone reads your draft of it, they don't say, oh, this fucking guy phoned it in, this is dog shit. They can see that you worked hard to do the best you can. Hey man, we don't always get Fight Club to, to work on, unfortunately. So you're gonna work on a lot of stuff. If you're lucky, you'll work on a lot of films that may not necessarily be your favorite films. The question is, can you still bring something cool to it that satisfies you as a writer? And in a way, kind of like, you know, up, up the bar a little bit, despite everyone's expectations. There's nothing better than low expectations and as a writer, over delivering. Like a lot of times producers or execs just feel like this, this project's just kind of DOA, just, all right, we'll give it another writer a spin and see blah, blah, blah. And then you surprise them and it's fucking awesome. Because then you realize they didn't, they didn't expect anything out of me other than taking another turn on the wheel. Then they read it and went, hey, you know what, there's kind of a cool movie here. I mean, it seems like a small victory, but a lot of times small victories are all we have. The important thing is that you haven't hurt yourself craft-wise as a writer by phoning it in. You went for it. That's really what you do. They pay you good money when you're hired, and I think the least you can do is give it 100%. Plus, if you don't, you're going to be bored to hell, man. If you're not trying to make it better, oh, what agony, dude. It's already tough. You make this thing better. And, you know, Romeo Must Die is a great example of 
if I just pitch that project to you, it just seems kind of stock. You know, what we did was make it better than what you would expect. And also, you know, Leah was a huge part of that, and it was Jet's first lead in an American movie. But w when I went into it, it's like, I love those movies. But it's like, this movie's going to be better than you would think if you read the log line. And it was better, and subsequently it was a hit. But really, aim to make it better. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, just make it better, man. 10% better on a lot of movies is huge. So, you know, just to, I think it's so easy just when everyone else is being a sad sack or phoning it in for you just to get in line with that. I just think you want to go for it, man. At all times, go for it. Do your best writing whenever possible. At one point, um, and you, it's almost an offhanded comment in the book, I think it's the section you were talking about how when you first got to LA, you worked as a PA for the AFM folks, um, and you were just kind of, you, as I said, made an offhanded comment like, hey, I'm going to be a writer, director, you know, and by the time I'm 25. And this is, and, but it got me, it got me thinking, um, you know, what is sort of your plan for the future? Do you want to be a director? Have you decided you don't want to be a director? Have you given up on that? Do you want to direct stuff? What is, you know, sort of, I mean, you've, you've achieved some, you know, significant success in the business. So what's next? What do you, what sort of motivates you? There was a juncture around 2000 and there where um, a script I had written, we got Chris Walken interested. I actually met with Chris Walken at, um, uh, now total glitch in the hard drive. What's the, the famous hotel right up on Sunset? Oh, uh, Marymount. Yeah, the Marymount, sorry. That's on Marymount. So I actually met with him. Uh, the, one of the coolest things about working with him briefly was my answering machine message of Chris Walken calling me, which everyone thinks is someone being Chris Walken, doing a Chris Walken impression, but it's actually him. Um, really cool guy. It was awesome. It was a small budget, and you're willing to do it for very little money, but I was like, this is the juncture where I can direct something I've written. It's an action piece. It, it'll all be good. And ultimately what happened is... The company, uh, foreign sales company, they didn't lock Christopher Walken down. They felt like he was overexposed. Of course, he went on to have another 15-year run after that. But they were kind of hedging, and then he left the project to do something else. So I was like that close uh, to directing. And at that point, you know, it's, it's really hard to get an opportunity to direct. You kind of have to make your own opportunity with the material you bring to it. Uh, I think at that point, I just felt like it would have been awesome to direct my own movie, whether anyone saw it or not, with Chris Walken. But that was also right as I was hitting the, the absolute peak of my writing career. And so in not stopping to direct that movie, I ended up doing some really great projects. And at that point, I was like, you know what, this is, I never set out to be a writer. I was trained as a cinematographer. Like everyone, I wanted to direct. Like so many things in Hollywood, you start out wanting to do this, you end up doing that. And I, at that point, I was very comfortable with like, you know what, this is what I do and, and, and I really like it. It would have been great to make that movie, but I don't have, at this point, I don't have that like yearning to run out and become a director. I'm very good with, with what I'm doing. That shouldn't discourage others. If you have an opportunity to direct, especially something you've written, you want to jump all over that, man. It just, it's got to be a good fit for your life. And for me, by the time it came around and I lost, I'm like, you know, let me really focus on the writing. And so what are your goals as a screenwriter? I mean, do you want to win an Oscar? I mean, what, what kind of is out there just in the future for you? I, I really, it's really interesting. I think, one, you want to keep making a living at it, which is increasingly hard in this business, without a doubt. That's Nathan, I'm glad you join us. Um, I think more as, as you enter your 40s, I think there's suddenly a question about what does it mean? Like, yeah, we can sit down and write um, somewhat of a straightforward stock cop movie or this or that or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, I think you want to work on something that feels like it's really, really good. I, and I don't mean necessarily even winning an Oscar. I mean something that you feel really good about. So this is the writer's dilemma. You want to keep making money, but that, that window for stuff they'll buy or specs that get sold gets, gets smaller. So that's where I am. And after writing this book, which is really a breath of fresh air, is like trying to find a vehicle that's commercial enough that really goes a little deeper in terms of what it's trying to say. And, and that makes it harder. I mean, I, I mean, we're talking theoretically, but I guess it's super simple to sit down and say, all right, let's write the bank heist movie. Now we all know there's some artful bank heist movies, but that kind of takes the pressure off to do something of, of deeper meaning. So I think if you, it's as, aspirins and applesauce. If you can get the applesauce and get that little aspirin in there, hey baby, open up. That, that's the writer's goal. So if you're coming at it from meaning first, it's probably not going to go well for you. 
Film is entertainment. It's always been entertainment. It's got to be entertaining. Like Birdman, it's super entertaining. It manages to say some heavy stuff too. American Beauty, same thing. Um, I think that's really the goal is, you know, if I could write something anywhere close to American Beauty, I would be very happy. You could just go ahead and put a pin in it right then. It'd be like, wow, that's... That. And so I think as a writer with, with 20 plus years experience, now I'm really trying to focus on creating stuff that is obviously entertaining, but stuff that you that the level of difficulty and artistry required is much higher. Otherwise, you're just kind of retreading the same. You know, I don't want to write ten Romeo Must Dies. I mean, I'll write five of them. <laughs> you know, I need the money. Yeah. But but you know, you want to try to push yourself because that I think that's the interesting thing about screenwriting is ultimately no one pushes you to be a better writer. Right? I mean, you may get jobs, they may push you to get a job or to sell something, but it's really incumbent on the writer to decide, hey, I'm not comfortable just with what I've accomplished. I want to try to get better too. And I, I think that's the number one thing I see with some writers. With a certain amount of success, they tend to stunt their own growth. They tend to feel like they know all the answers. They've been there, they've done that. And, and any kind of writing, I just don't think that's accurate. I think there's always room to grow and improve. And I think you're probably in trouble. The moment you think you've got it figured out, you're probably in trouble. And I think you always want to push yourself. And it, like I said though, it's always been entertainment. Uh, in my class this term, I have a guy working on a movie. <laughs> he came in and pitched it. And it's literally a movie about abortion and abortion rights. And it starts with the bombing of an abortion clinic. And even more bizarrely, uh, the whole class read the treatment and thought it was a comedy. <laughs> so, very smart guy, older guy, and I just said to him, I said, you know that like no one will touch this. This is one of those issues. Nobody want to, wants to make the abortion movie. And he said, that's fine because I want to write this movie knowing its commercial limitations. But this will really get, you know, be his first legitimate screenplay and get him going. I'm like, hey man, it's your dime. Do what you got to do. But, you know, it, it's funny though because... You train yourself instinctually. There's certain things. The moment you hear abortion movie, you just go, oh, no. You know, there's just certain things that were not, you know, that weren't meant to be commercial Hollywood movies. So find something you love it and really push for something interesting. That's the number one thing I find these days. I don't know how you feel. If I'm watching something, Netflix streaming or a new movie or something, I, I continually ask myself, am I interested? Is this interesting to me? Which is a kind of a weird question. It could be entertaining and not even be interesting. But something like True Detective, I don't know how you felt about it. I mean, I was just, up until, you know, when they crashed the ending, uh, it's funny, a good buddy of mine hadn't seen it, I said, listen, the first six episodes are some of the best television you'll ever see. Seven's okay, eight, I'm not a fan. I think, if I'd never seen the episode, the guy literally watched the first seven and refused to watch episode eight. <laughs> it's like, that. the first six episodes that are so good that you're interested. It, it really did. I mean, I remember yeah, the reaction yeah, yeah. to it. Everyone was like, whoa, what is this? You know, that should be the goals, the stuff that really grabs you. We all like certain junk food, but wow, I mean, yeah, True Detective and, and Homeland and, and all these shows have really opened up the idea that this shit can be really interesting. So I think that's what you strive for. Mm -hmm. And this sort of segues into the next question. What does a screenwriting career, now you've been at it 20 years, what does a screenwriting career look like at this stage? I mean, Romeo Must Die now was 15 years ago. Yeah. So so what exactly does your career look like? How many meetings a month do you get? How many rewrite, you know? I, I think, I think you know, coupled with aging a aging out a little bit and, you know, the crash in 08, which really changed the model. I mean, there was a model before the crash and the model after, and the model before had a lot more work. It had a lot more development work, uh, getting paid a lot more money. So there's less meetings, there's less opportunities, there's more of a focus on creating your own opportunity. Uh, kind of ironically, like the way you got started back in the day, which is um, self-generating material. You'll hear this from agents, you'll hear it from managers. Um, a writer who has the ability to self-generate um, is in a great place because people always need new fresh material. I remember early when I was in Endeavor, um, Tom Strickler was the head of Endeavor and he had a quote which was, don't become a slave to the grid. And what that meant was, don't become a slave to the open writing assignment grid. Don't just feed, like, you know what's great about open writing assignments? You don't have to come up with the original idea, you just have to come up with a take on it and it pays you up front. Well, what writer doesn't want half the heavy lifting done and money? <laughs> That's why they're also so hard to get. So 
what's interesting about it is, you know, if you get into working and God knows you're fortunate enough to be able to, to work, great, man, do it. But there's still no substitute for self-generating material because A, you'll probably be the most passionate about it. And B, they're always looking for something new and fresh. I hear a lot of cop-outs. Early in my career, I was big on cop-outs. You've heard this many times. Hollywood doesn't buy good scripts. It's just absurd. Believe me, they can't buy enough good scripts. In fact, there just aren't that many great scripts. That's what young writers fail to understand. It's not some conspiracy, man. It's just the bar is high. So when they see a great script, they jump all over that fucking thing and fast. The question is, are you delivering them? And then look, no writer wants to ask themselves, am I delivering them a great quality script? That's a hard question, man. A lot of times you're not. So, you know, Hollywood will buy as many great scripts as people can manage to write. It may take a week, a year, whatever. But the, the reality is there are so few great scripts. You read scripts, I read scripts. How many times do you go, this is a great script? It, it's not a yeah, usual occurrence, let's just say that. Perfect. And that's no different for readers. Imagine, I, do you ever read scripts? You yeah, know, absolutely. I never write a script, so I'm constantly hearing stuff okay. from the other writers. Imagine you're a development exec and you have to read 15 to 20 scripts a week. What's that like? Is there any agony, you know, the bad script headache where you're like hosting uh, younger writers, bad ideas in your head for the hour it takes to read it? It's agony. I can't imagine doing it. Yeah, you know, 15 bad scripts a week. The great news is they're always buying great scripts. The bad news is most people who think they're delivering great scripts aren't delivering great scripts. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, the next logical question is, are you writing spec scripts? Because it seems like that's what the market wants. I need to. I'm starting on one out. It's been a little while. I haven't because I wrote a book that, like I said, Endeavor sent it to, I'm sorry, WME sent it to Justin Lin, and that took a year and a half to work on. And then after that, I wanted, I reached the point where I wanted to write this book on writing because I just had enough. I just heard so much bullshit over 20 years. I'm like, it's time to set the record straight, especially about arbitration. So I said, fuck it, I'm gonna take a year off and write this. And in the middle of that, I got called in to save uh, The Man with the Iron Fist 2, which now is available VOD and Blu-ray and DVD on April 14th. Okay. Yesterday, for the first time, I saw the one sheet, and I'm very happy to report they used bright pink on the lettering. I was very, very excited about that, as you can imagine. So. Um, so basically what I did is I started working on, on writing book, writing book, and then just stopped, saved the movie, I had 30 days to save it, saved it, they greenlit it, went out to shoot it, and I went right back to work on, on the book. So now I'm at the, pay, the point where I need to start a new script, exactly like every other writer out there. That's the thing, man. I mean, again, there's certain guys that will work for the rest of their careers. They, they have the pedigree. You know, there's the John August guy who's, who's proven he's a great writer and it's someone you want to hire. It, unless you're at that level, the, the two percentile, you're going to need to keep writing, you know, and, and that's, nobody gets an exemption from that that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah. A quick plug for my email and fax blast service. I'm running a special right now where you can purchase one third of the blast for a little more than $50. The total list is around 6,000 contacts. Again, this is my producer's blast, so there's about 6,000 contacts in it. So if you purchase this first third, it's about um, 2,000 contacts. So it's still a solid number of producers you're sending to. I've done this just to lower the barrier to entry so that people can check out the blast service without having to invest a whole lot of money up front. The one thing that hasn't changed, I still do require that you join SYS Select, which at the time of this recording is just $24.99 per month. The reason I require this as part of the process is that I'm going to personally look at your log line and query letter and help you make them as good as possible. This is really for everyone's benefit. I want to make sure that the query letters and log lines are well written before I send them out to my list. The people receiving these email queries queries can unsubscribe to these blasts. So sending out a bunch of half baked query letters will just burn the list up, which hurts everyone who might ever want to use the service in the future. Also, by getting my feedback on your login and query letter, it means your response rate is going to be much higher. I've been doing this for a while and I've had a lot of success from cold query letters. So I think getting my feedback alone is valuable and well worth the price of admission. You're welcome to join SYS Select for just one month and then quit once your query letter is ready to go. I hope you don't, obviously, but that's totally fine. And once your query letter is approved by me, you're free to buy the other blasts later on, even if you're no longer a member of SYS Select. You don't have to rejoin down the road. It really is just to get your query letter and logline into shape. And once it's in shape, as I said, you're, you're free to send those blasts over the course of any number of years. Just got to send me an email and um, 
make payment for the blast, and I'm happy to send them out once they're approved and through the um, SYS Select forum. Also, lots of people have joined SYS Select just to get my input on their log line or query letter. So you're more than welcome to join, even if you don't want to use my blast service. So if you're looking for some feedback on your log line and query letter from an industry pro, this is a great, a very inexpensive way of doing it. Again, you don't have to use my blast service if you want to join SYS Select and get my feedback on your log line. Also, by joining SYS Select, you get access to the SYS Select forum. In the forum, I've reviewed hundreds of query letters and log lines, and you can see that my notes and the revisions the writers made. So this is a great resource just to help you write your own log line and query letter. You also get access to all the SYS Select classes that have been done over the last couple of years. There are more than a dozen classes covering all sorts of screenwriting topics, from from writing your script to pitching your script to writing and producing short films. It's a great resource for any writer who wants to further their screenwriting education. I also get the question, how long will the sale be going? And I honestly don't know. If it seems to be working well, I'll probably keep it going for a while. But if it just ends up being a lot more work, I'll probably just revert back to the one price for buying the entire Blast in one big purchase. So the one-third Blast plus one month of SOS Select is just $78. Again, that's you're getting my review of your login and query letter and then you're getting the blast to, to over 2,000 industry producers for the $78 and then of course you can buy the remaining um, two-thirds of the blast for um, whatever the math is on that. I think it's $109 so but you don't have to and there's no obligation to do that the point of this is to just give you a taste of the blast service so you can see how good it is see how powerful it is and then hopefully you'll you'll buy the remaining blast using your same query letter it's really never going to get any cheaper than that so if you ever wanted to try out this blast service that I talk about a lot on my podcast now is definitely the time to do it anyway to check this out go to selling your screenplay.com slash blast again that's selling your screenplay.com slash blast. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.